Who is the strongest Berserk character? <laughs> it's a question we've thought about numerous times. Aside from the satirical picks like Donovan and Schnaz, it's kind of a debate. I mean, there's so many strong characters. It depends on the situation. It depends on whether or not someone's in their apostle form or not. So in this tier list, we're going to take a look at all the Berserk's strongest characters, and I'm going to determine who I think is the strongest. Of course, you guys can disagree in the comments, but with that said, let's get started. It's time! So the first tier we have is the Weak Bees. Uh, these are basically human-like characters who don't really possess any strength or powers and usually are just generally pussies. Uh, so here we go. First one on the docket, we got Mule. Now, he was leading a charge against the Kushans, so he showed a lot of bravery and a lot of heart, but in terms of feats, I haven't seen one thing that he's done that's impressed me. Next one we got up on the docket is Laban. Now, he was the one that saved the women in Midland. Um, you know, the women were captured by the Kushan army. You know, they were used for sexual practices and such, so he was the one that snuck into the castle. They dressed up as Kushan soldiers, and they all got to safety. They were able to reach Griffith and his army. So, I mean, very Chad-like, but I've never really seen him in a fight, so I can't really say. And then we got Gaston. As a specimen, yes, I'm intimate. Um, this one's probably going to be a little bit of a disappointment for most people, but... I, you know, we really haven't seen him in battle, so we can't really determine his strength. And then we got Bonebeard, and even with his transformation, this dude straight up lost to Isidro, so right, right there, straight up bitch. Then we got Corcus, you know, original Band of the Hawk. You know, of course, you know, he probably possessed some skill. He was able to stay alive for so long. But again, who did he defeat in battle? We don't really know. Then we got Magnifico, uh, Farnese's ignoramus of a big brother. <laughs> uh, then we got the two brothers. Theaters now, coming this summer. Two brothers. The King of Midland and Julius. And then we got Adon, the leader of the mighty blue whale ultra heavy armored fierce assault annihilation corps. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I gotta say, he was always pretty funny in the Berserk 1997 anime. Sorry, my diaphragm taking the day off. I'll just do that over now. But the voice actor just did a phenomenal job with him. Uh, but again, you know, for the purposes of this list, what did he exactly do? He lost to Casca at Doldry Castle, and uh, he didn't really do anything. He called upon his brother Samson to fight Guts, so pretty much a pussy through and through. So the next tier we have is humans. Of course, most people in Berserk are humans, but these would be humans that are relatively strong. They're more or less warriors, people who have developed their skills in some way. So we get Azan of the Holy Iron Chain Knights, Bazuzo, Gambino. Now, I should say with these tier list, if the characters are on the same tier, that means that they're relatively the same strength. So if they were fighting each other in a 1v1 battle, I would expect them to more or less have a very good battle. Someone's going to win, of course, but, you know, the strength is close enough where it's going to be a close battle. Now, later on in the list, you will see characters that you'll be like, well, they have impressive magical abilities. However, I don't know if I would take them over a character in a lower list. But we'll talk about that when we get there. Now, <laughs> shock to many people, uh, Rickert's on this tier. Now, of course, ironically, Rickert is, you know, on the highest tier because he slapped Griffith. But, you know, in terms of his actual strength, it, I, I feel like this is a good tier for him. Like, he's right next to Gambino. Like, I feel like if he were to fight Gambino in a real fight, that would be pretty damn close. Um... Rickert is like a teenager now. He's like Guts's age when he was in the Golden Age arc. And I feel like Guts would have easily defeated Gambino in the Golden Age arc. And um, it's not like Rickert can hold a huge sword or anything like that. Um, he does have the slap of death. But um, Gambino is an actual swordsman, so I feel like he would give him a run for his money. We got Donovan on this list as well. Now, of course, Gambino would probably be a little stronger than Donovan, considering that Gambino was the leader of the group. However, Donovan is just yoked out of his mind. I mean, Ronnie Coleman style. Holy fuck. So I, I would imagine he's pretty strong, and I think he would give Gambino a run for his money. 
Then we got Isidro. Now, the reason I put Isidro higher than week B is because he was able to defeat Bonebeard. And um, that's one of the criteria for this is if you beat someone on a lower tier, inevitably you should be on a higher tier. So that's why he's here and he's being trained by Guts as well. So I feel like he deserves it. Then we got Judo and Casca. Now, Casca, if she trained after the Eclipse, she could probably be on the next tier. But I feel like since she missed like four years of her life and hasn't really been training, this is probably a good tier for her. She is higher than Adan, who she did defeat at Doldry Castle. And I feel like that was probably peak Casca. Well, she did get stronger after the one year that Guts left. So, you know, possibly higher. Once I reveal the next tier, you're going to be like, well, I don't really see her beating anyone on that tier. So I feel like this is probably the tier she belongs on. Okay, so the next tier is the strong humans. Now, if you see what I was talking about before, if you look at this tier and compare it to, say, like, Casca's tier, there's no way that I see Casca beating Pippin. I mean, he's just too powerful. There's no way I see Casca beating the Baki Raka or the leader of the Purple Rhino Knights or Roderick. Now, you could say that Isma, that Casca could probably defeat her on land, but if it was in the sea, Isma would have a decided advantage and she would most likely win. In fact, she should win. She's going to be a lot faster. She also does possess the ability as a marrow to alter sound waves underwater and affect the hearing of her opponents like they did with the sea god. So that would be situational, but the fact that she has the ability to change into a marrow, I feel like would give her a decided advantage. Now, Pippin, of course, uber strong. Roderick, now if it was a battle between Roderick and Pippin, you would expect Pippin to win with his mere strength. However, Roderick has shown to be very crafty and strategic, as noted by the fact that he was able to outsmart Bonebeard in the sea, even when he looked like he was at a disadvantage. Now, I was thinking about putting Baskan to a higher level, um, but when you look at the next level again, I feel like the people up there could beat him pretty handily. But one of the great feats of Baskan was the fact that he was most likely going to defeat Guts if it was not for the help of Zod. Guts lost his sword. He was on the ground. Zod chucks him a sword, and then, of course, Guts wins the battle. But without that assistance, I'm thinking Biscon wins that one. Um, so Biscon, super strong. Now, if I put a Golden Age version of Guts on this list, I feel like this would be the tier he would be on as well. And then rounding things off, we got the Baki Raka. All right, so now we're on the Weak Apostle tier. Now, as you can see, Serpico is on this tier. I don't mean that he's a Weak Apostle. I just mean if he were to fight a Weak Apostle, like a Kelpie, like he did at Morgan's Village, he would be able to defeat it. He would be able to hold his own. So Serpico is on this tier. Salat is on this tier as well. And that's an interesting battle in and of itself. Salat versus Serpico. You know, I made a poll, I think it was a couple months ago, who would win in a battle. And um, that would be really fun to watch because I don't know exactly who would win. I mean, if I had to put my money on it, from a meta level, the story writer, um, i.e. Mira, if he were still alive, would probably have Serpico win. But I'm not so sure if it was an even fight. If it was a non-biased fight, oh boy, that would be a close one. And then we got the Snake Baron. Um, some pretty impressive feats, you know, raiding a village. He was giving Guts all he could handle in the Black Swordsman arc. And uh, we got Farnese. Now, a lot of people are going to be confused here. Like, are we talking about the same Farnese, the one who could barely swing a sword? No, we're talking about the Farnese that can call upon the four kings, the four cardinal guardian angels, the ones that Shirka called upon when she was in Morgan's village. Now, at the time of the sea god, if you remember, Farnese called upon these same four to protect Roderick's boat. Now, that looks pretty damn powerful to me. I would say she's more than deserving to be in this tier if she can pull off that type of magic. And in fact, I almost want to put her a tier higher. But uh, once you see who's in that tier, again, I can't do it. Then we had the female apostle, the one that Guts had sex with. Question! 
Was Guts cheating on Casca when he had sex with this apostle? Or uh, was it just an effective trap to kill one of his adversaries? You decide. It's a trap! Then we got the rape horse. Um, you know, the more I think about it, I don't know if the rape horse is deserving to be on this tier. I mean, Guts just kind of effed him up. But... He was pretty strong. I mean, he was able to mount Farnese. <laughs> I'll let you decide on that one. And then uh, we got the trolls from Morgan's village. And then we got Mosgus's disciples who were fairly strong. Okay, and now above the weak apostle, we got the apostle tier. Now on this tier, I got Shirka. Now I feel like Shirka... This is a hard one again because she probably could be on the next tier, which is the Strong Apostles. It's debatable. She's probably in between, to be honest. But again, there's someone on that tier that I just can't see her being as strong as, so I feel like she's probably on this tier. We also have Wyald, who was basically effing up guts. Um, this was during the Golden Age arc and would have won if not from the interference of Zod. Then we got the Baron, who again was effing up guts during the Black Swordsman arc. And then we got Mose Gus, who was definitely holding his own against the Conviction arc. And Rosine, who again during the Lost Children's chapters was giving guts all he could handle. And uh, I feel like a lot of the feats here are people who were fighting Guts and were giving him a hard time, save for Shirka. Now, I feel like the strongest of this tier is definitely Shirka. She could use her magic to pretty much defeat anyone. That doesn't mean it would be easy, though. I feel like each one of these people would give Shirka a tough battle. Okay, so now we're on the Strong Apostle tier, and uh, you can see a lot of Griffiths men here, a lot of Griffiths Apostles. And um, now this is the reason that I said that Shirka doesn't belong on this tier is because Daiba's on the tier. And I just don't see a way in which Shirka could defeat Daiba. If you remember, Daiba can control the Daka. He can fly on his Garuda. He can summon a Kundalini. I mean, this man possesses powerful magic. He's definitely old, so he has years of experience. He's honed his craft, whereas Shirka, at best, maybe she's been practicing magic since she was like five. So maybe she's got like eight years, nine years under her belt, eight or nine years under her belt. Daiba's probably got decades, so Daiba is definitely above Shirka. And then we see the various apostles under Griffith, the Hawk of Light. We see Grunbeld, Locus, Roxas. We have Irvine, who by far, he's got my favorite apostle design. Now, my favorite apostle in terms of personality would be Roxas. I just love the fact that when he meets Griffith, he's like, hey, one day I'm going to lop off your head. I just love the bravado, love the confidence, love the go against the grain kind of attitude. You know, that's kind of me in life, you know. I'm the guy who's jumping off the bridge, you know. If, if people are going to safety, I'm like, fuck it, you know, let's just go for it. Uh, and if people are thinking one thing, I like to think the other. So, uh, you know, me and Roxas are like two peas in the pod. You know, in terms of favorite apostle, it's got to be Roxas. But in terms of favorite apostle design, it's got to be Irvine. I mean, just absolutely badass look there. Now, a lot of people are going to be surprised by the fact that Sonya's on this list. Like, okay, like, she does possess powerful abilities, but, you know, she doesn't really have any fighting skill. We haven't really seen her fight anyone of note. Let me present the case here, because I feel like she's undervalued by a lot of people. So here are some of her powers. Sonya is a mind reader, and she's a prophetess. Now, she was the one that was able to give the pontiff, essentially like the pope, the vision of the Hawk of Light. Now, this is what helped the pontiff sort of believe that he was the chosen one, and that's why he prostrated in front of Griffith. And because of this, everyone at Virtanus was sort of forced into believing Griffith, that he was the savior, and this allowed Griffith to marry Charlotte and become the king of Midland or the king of Falconia. You know, it's not concrete. The wedding never happened, obviously, but, you know, we would assume that it probably would have more or less happened at one point. 
Although with the final chapter being out, it's kind of up in the air. It's hard to say. The whole purpose of Sonia was to more or less trick the pontiff into believing that Griffith was the savior. And it worked beautifully. So with this ability, she could basically ingratiate herself into anyone's good graces. And that's a very powerful ability. We saw at the docks of Virtanis how she befriended Shirka. Now, I don't know if she used her abilities on Shirka. That's, you know, up for debate. As a mind reader, she can sort of get into your thoughts and tell you what you want to hear. So, more or less, she can avoid battle if need be. And if she were in a battle with you, she would know all your moves before you did it. So, it probably wouldn't be too hard for her to defeat you. Now, she doesn't really possess any strength or skill in battle, so her resources are better used by someone else. But like, for example, if she was riding on Irvine, she could direct Irvine in a way that would like make him unstoppable. So her abilities are more so for like a pair of people or for like an army. Remember, she was directing Griffith's army in the right direction against the Kushan soldiers. Like, you know, she was optimizing the battle plans in the heat of the moment. So her skills are a little bit different. In a 1v1 battle, she's at a disadvantage. But if each side has an army, or if she just has one other person who's stronger than her, like Irvine, I feel like Irvine is kind of like her perfect partner. Like, she could ride Irvine, and Irvine could use his bow to defeat the enemies, and she could direct him in the right directions. That would be a very hard adversary to stop. Like, she's essentially equivalent to the other apostles under Griffith. It seems like under Griffith's regime, she's on a level playing field with all those apostles. So I, I would definitely say she's worthy of being up here. And uh, now on the next tier, we got the Giga Chat himself, Guts. This is the Uber Apostle tier. And I don't really have to explain why Guts is up here. He's just a Chad among Chads, has defeated several apostles. He defeated Groombeld at the Mansion of the Spirit Tree. All, you know, although he didn't get the finishing blow, it's, it's pretty obvious he would have defeated Groombeld. I have no doubts that he would defeat Locus, Roxas, Irvine. He pretty much defeated Daiba at the Virtanis Harbor, so I, I think that's without a doubt he would defeat him. Now on the same tier, we also have Zod. Now this is a little bit questionable because Zod is most likely stronger than Guts. I mean, all the signs and indications are that if it were a battle, Zod in his apostle form is going to defeat Guts. But it's not an easy battle. We could definitely see Guts with the Berserker armor holding his own. And even if Zod wins... I guarantee you Guts is going to take a lot of chunks of flesh out of him. So it's hard to say, but I feel like they're relatively on the same level. Then we got Ganishka here as well. Now we're going to have two different versions of Ganishka. We're going to have Ganishka and Shiva. Yeah, Shiva will still be on this list, but just in a different tier. And then we have Flora as well, a very powerful mage. I would definitely say she's more powerful than Daiba. She was the beloved teacher of Shirka, and she was around during Geyseric's time, so she's at least a thousand years old. So even if Daiba is like hundreds of years old, I feel like Flora's got more experience and more power than him. Okay, so our next tier is the near god tier. Now these people would be slightly below the god hand. Um, very strong in their own right, possess incredible abilities, but they're not quite on the level as the god hand. So first up on the docket, we got Skull Knight. Obviously supremely powerful, very quick, possesses the sword of actuation which can cleave through space and time, and uh, is just generally a badass. I think it's pretty much understood that he could defeat Zod if he wanted to. However, if you watched any of my theory videos, I think that Skull Knight and Zod were at one point the same person. And maybe perhaps Skull Knight can't actually kill Zod. Maybe that would somehow destroy his ego. Uh, who knows? Next up, we got Shiva. This was Ganishka after he went into the man-made behalot that Daiba created. So he was absorbing all the monsters and Daka and just became this fearsome enemy. And I think it makes sense that he would be stronger than Zod and Guts. I mean, I don't think there's any way that Zod or Guts can defeat him. 
given the fact that they had to team up just to defeat Ganishka's apostle form. So there's no way they're defeating Shiva. And then we got the Sea God. Now, a lot of you are going to be surprised because you're going to be like, well, wait a minute. Guts defeated the Sea God. Why isn't Guts on this tier? How come the Sea God is not on a tier below this? Here's the thing. Guts went inside the Sea God and he was essentially defeated. He was down for the count. The only reason he won was because the Marrow used their sound to disrupt the Sea God. This gave Guts enough time so it wouldn't distort his equilibrium and then he could stand up and slice the heart. But there's no way he's doing that without the Marrow. It's kind of like the same situation with Bascon where if Zod doesn't toss him the sword, he's losing the Bascon. And again, he got the help of Shirka as well. Shirka was stimulating him awake and she was also tempering the Beast of Darkness within. So there was a lot of help on Guts' side in this one. So you can't really say that Guts is as strong as the Sea God. And then another surprising one, we got the Moonlight Boy. Now again, this is more in terms of like the Moonlight Boy's powers. When he's in his ethereal form, he can go within the Berserker armor. He, he could just kind of flow in there and he can stop Guts from doing things that might be detrimental to his friends and to himself. And um, he saved Guts when he was inside the Sea God when it was pooling up with blood. And um, not even Shirka could do this. Shirka was dispelled from Guts' body. And um, Moonlight Boy just navigated his way in there and he saved Guts. He pointed towards the exit. So Moonlight Boy is immensely powerful and you have to take into account that he is a fusion of the Demon Child and Griffith. So he has great powers. In fact, his powers may rival the God Hand. It, it may even be possible that you could move him up on the list. And then to round things out, we got the Egg of the Perfect World. Now, again, some people may be confused by this. I myself had to question this, and I was like, is he really that high? But then I thought to myself, he was able to take the demon child and take Griffith's astral body and convert it into a human form. I mean, that takes a lot of power. It takes a lot of OD and... um. It's just an impressive feat, but besides that, when Skull Knight was attacking him, now Skull Knight was able to injure him with his sword, he was still able to grab Luca and take Luca to his little pit where he had an altar. That was pretty freaking incredible. I mean, Skull Knight is an impressive being, and he even escaped from the Skull Knight after that as well. So it's like, this guy was pretty powerful, and he wasn't even really trying to fight. He was just fleeing because he knew he had to birth the perfect world, as it were. So, very powerful being. Don't take him lightly. Okay, so next up, we got the God Hand tier. Now, you'll notice that we have the five members of the God Hand, and we also have Donin. Now, we'll get to Donin in a second. Now, I feel like the God Hand is pretty self-explanatory. They all possess incredible abilities. It's hard to say whether or not you can kill a member of the God Hand. It's possible with the Sword of Actuation that Skull Knight forged that you could do it. However, if you think about it, the Sword of Actuation is a culmination of Baelits. And Baelits are what give Apostles and the God Hand members their powers. So fusing the Baelits together, which seem to be the culmination, it, it almost seems to be the culmination of one's desires. Like, you know, you're sacrificing people who are close to you, so you're giving into your desires, and it's fusing the fears and the trepidation of others, the evil, if you will, into this apostle form. As noted by the fact that once you defeat an apostle, it sort of takes away all these souls, all these past people that you sacrificed, and leaves just a shell. As noted by the fact that when they defeated Wyald, we just saw this old man that was in this decrepit state. So it is possible. I mean, apostles can be defeated in the physical world with regular weapons. Very difficult to do so, however, it can be done. Whereas the God Hand, it almost seems like because they don't exist in the physical world, you need to use means of the astral realm like the Baelits 
which can sort of cross over and um, defeat them that way. So th- that's um, a very tall order and thus making them very powerful. However, their influence in the physical world is limited. At least it was until the age of Fantasia. Now with Fantasia, everything is overlapping, so it seems like their influence is a little greater. Now does that mean in the age of Fantasia, where things are overlapping, that normal means can destroy the God Hand? Hard to say. And then I put Donnan in this tier as well because I feel like because she is the Flower Storm Monarch, she is presumably the strongest mage on Elfhelm. Her powers are pretty damn powerful. Now, we have yet to see a display of those powers, but the mere fact that she took Shirka and Farnese to the Magic Mushroom Room, um, to the Room of Dreams, shows that she could probably enter deep realms of the astral realm and probably has the ability to create and destroy things there. So although we don't have any verifiable proof, we don't have any feats to go off of, my feeling is that she probably rivals the god hand, at least in the reverse direction, if that makes sense. Like the god hand is evil and she is good, she's a mage, she cultivates her powers for creation, whereas the god hand cultivates their powers of destruction and fear. I think that's probably a reasonable conclusion on my part, but maybe some people feel that she should be lower on this list. Maybe some people higher, who knows. And then the last here is the idea of evil. Now, the idea of evil is created by people's desire for reason, for an explanation as to why there's pain and suffering in their life. And through that culmination of feelings, dark feelings as it were, it creates the idea of evil. And then the idea of evil in turn is able to create the Baelits, which give rise to the apostles and the god hand, which control the people. It's kind of like a feedback loop, if you will. And through this, the idea of evil is able to weave destiny. It's like a tapestry, if you will. And um, it's able to weave causality. And now in the future, I will make a video about what causality is. Um, in terms of berserk and in terms of a philosophical level because now this debate of causation goes back to Aristotle's time, so thousands of years, but it became more hotly contested during the time of David Hume. Now, he put forward an argument that you can't really prove causation with anything. So, for an example, I have a ball in my hand and I let go of it. Now, I see it drop to the ground and, you know, I repeat the experiment, I do it a hundred times, and I know about the laws of gravity, and I say, well, every time I drop the ball, it's going to fall down. Well, what if I went to outer space and I dropped the ball again? Well, it doesn't fall down. So it's not inevitable that the ball will fall down if I drop it. And you know, you could do this with a thousand million things. And you could say, well, there are certain conditions in which it will do what you say. However, there are conditions in which it will not do what you say. So therefore, it's not a cause and effect relationship. Even the fundamental laws of the universe Hume would argue that even though they're fundamental to the universe, they're not cause and effect because, for example, like if you were to go prior to the start of the universe, prior to the Big Bang, there was no such thing as time. So therefore, were there such things as fundamental laws of the universe or are fundamental laws just a consequence of the known universe? And what if there are multiple universes? Do they all follow the same laws? So you can't even prove that, really. Um, So it's a hard thing to prove cause and effect. It almost seems to be like the underlying thing of the universe itself. However, physicists, especially quantum physicists, believe that the universe is deterministic. In fact, Einstein has a famous quote that God does not play dice with the universe. So if everything is deterministic, um, then that means there must be a cause and effect, right? I mean, it's all determined. It must follow a natural flow. Well, there's even this whole theory of backwards causation. So like Einstein was talking about quantum entanglement and he referred to it as spooky action at a distance where like, 
two particles could affect each other in real time and be separated by like the length of the universe because they're entangled. So one of the theories that's being floated around is the idea of reverse causation, where a particle goes back in time and causes something to happen in the past. Uh, So it's pretty crazy stuff, but we're kind of getting in the weeds here. And um, basically what I wanted to talk about was the idea of Hume and how he believed in a deterministic universe as well. However, he also believed in free will. It's a concept known as compatibilism. Um, So you believe in determinism. You believe everything is sort of ordered and it's going to happen the way it's going to happen. However, you also believe in free will. You know, I'm usually not a big fan of Sam Harris, but he kind of had a nice quote about it where he said, Compatibilism is kind of like being a puppet that's being pulled by strings. However, you love your strings. Um, (laughs) So you can't control your actions. You're still controlled by the person who's moving the puppet, if you will. However, you're choosing to love those actions. You're choosing to love the way in which you're being moved. (laughs) Um, uh, So anyway, Idea of Evil is the strongest character of Berserk. That's it. That's the list. Uh, Tell me what you guys think in the comments, and uh, I'll catch you guys on the flip side.